This is the Get Sellers Calling You Marketing Podcast for real estate agents, and I'm Beatty Carmichael. To learn how to generate more listings from past clients in sphere of influence, geographic farming, and commercial investment property, visit our website at GetSellersCallingYou.com. And now, let's begin our next session of Get Sellers Calling You. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm so glad you joined me again. My name is Penny, and um, I'm just super thrilled to have you here for this next session of Get Sellers Calling You. And I'm joined yet again with my great friend, Beatty Carmichael. Beatty is the CEO of Master Grabber, the creator of Agent Dominator, and one of the top marketing experts in the real estate field. Beatty, welcome back. Well, thank you. It's great to be back and uh, very excited to be here especially with the topic we're going to be talking about today. And speaking of which, what are we going to be discussing today? So for uh, so we're going to be doing a radical faith call today, which for our listeners, what that means is um, uh, we alternate on the Get Sellers Calling You channel. We alternate real estate marketing and Bible teaching. And so today we're going to be doing a Bible teaching session on uh, basically living by faith and in obedience to the Lord. So if that's a topic you do have interest in, I encourage you to stay. But if it's not, feel free to skip this episode and come back to the next one as we talk about real estate marketing. So with that, Penny, today is part three of a series that we're doing. And uh, it looks like this is going to be a four-part series. So I don't think we'll get everything in on today's call. But this is setting up the stage on the topic, is the Sabbath for today? And this seems to be one of those topics that has a lot of conflict and sometimes controversy in uh, Christendom. And I think probably more so, uh, I'm just making an assumption, more so in America than maybe other places in the the world. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some sacred cows. And part of the sacred cows is kind of why we this becomes controversial. But it's something the Lord put on my heart to really cover because there's a lot that the Lord says about this. And today we're going to be uncovering one more. So just uh, kind of give a reminder for those who've been on this topic with us. We have uh, the first session, we talked about what are those things where that people claim this is what, this is where the Bible says we don't really need to honor the Sabbath anymore. It's part of the old covenant. We're in the new covenant. Uh, Paul says not to treat any day uh, or esteem one day more Uh, special than another and things of that sort. But then we started to take a look at the scriptures. And the first thing we looked at was that the Sabbath is referencing an attribute of God, which is he worked six days in creation and he rested on the seventh. Mm -hmm. And he calls the Sabbath a holy day. He declares that pattern of working six days and resting on the seventh as a holy pattern back in Genesis. And it's actually the very first time through in all of scripture that he calls anything holy. And so he gives not only this pattern, uh, what we call the Sabbath, okay, but Mm -hmm. it's the pattern of six days work, one day rest. Uh, He gives it preeminence in everything that is holy in his word. And that is the first thing he declares is holy. Then the... Second thing we looked at, which was last session, we saw that the Sabbath was part of the Ten Commandments, and we started to look at different passages in the Ten Commandments. Now, this is the Old Covenant, and people say, well, the Old Covenant is obsolete. Yes, but they're missing the fact of what the Ten Commandments are because God says the Ten Commandments are to be observed how long? Do you remember how long they're to be observed? The Ten Commandments forever? Forever, yes. So are we still in that timeline of forever? (laughs) Yes. Okay. So we've got a direct command from the Lord to observe his commandments forever, and we're still in that timeline. Yeah. And so what's happening is these things that we're going through seem to conflict with the earlier verses that we looked at on the first session that said where people claim we're not, we're, we're not, we don't have to honor the Sabbath anymore. It was a sign of the covenant that's old, that's gone now. The covenant's obsolete, not to esteem one day any greater than another. And yet we're supposed to interpret scripture by scripture and see what the totality of scripture says. And so far what we've seen is that God calls this day 
holy for a reason. And it seems like he wants us to continue to treat it that way. So today we're going to take a really interesting perspective that probably most people have never thought about, but it's very, very clear in the scripture. And that is that the, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments and the covenant or basically God's testimonies is a wedding vow. Mm. And it's our wedding. The Sabbath is part of our wedding vow with God. Let me ask you a question. So you and Brian got married a few years back. I know it's more than a few years, but we won't say how long, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, back in the days of youth. And you made certain vows to Brian during the wedding ceremony. Do those vows ever become obsolete? Not unless one of us ends the marriage. That's right. Not unless till death do you part, right? That's right. So we see the same thing with our wedding vow. And let me ask you one other question. Even though you love Brian and you honor your wedding, your marriage with him because you love him so much, are the vows you took and that you committed to still an obligation for you to do, even if you don't do it out of love? Yes. Okay. So we have this juxta, not a juxtaposition, but kind of two things hitting. Number one, we honor the marriage vow because we love our spouse, but we also honor the marriage vow because it was a vow that we made before the Lord. So we have both, we do it out of love, but there's also very clearly an obligation that we have to do it, whether it's in love or not. Is that Mm -hmm. making sense? It does. Yeah. Okay. So I want to set the stage as we move into this part. Uh, Let me ask you a question. What would you say? Okay. If we do not honor the Sabbath as holy, is that sin? Yes. And why is that sin? Because it goes against what God has asked us to do. Yeah. It goes against what God has asked us to do. Uh, Let let me rephrase that so we can be clear on it. It goes against what God has commanded us to do, right? Mm -hmm. He calls it a command. Yeah. And uh, uh, which is more powerful than simply asking. So if it's a sin, Why do you think people feel it's not a sin if we don't honor the Sabbath? Hmm. Let let me let me let me back into this question so you understand why I'm asking it. Are there lots of Christians who love the Lord who do not habitually honor the Sabbath as holy? Yes. Why do you think they don't consider it a sin? For them to habitually not honor it. Because they feel like it's irrelevant for today. Ah, really good. And why do you think they feel it's irrelevant today? Because of, I'm going to give you two options, and you can give me a third if if none of these two apply. Number one, because they have studied the scriptures and concluded it's irrelevant. Number two, because they really want to do their own thing, and they hope it's irrelevant, so they find scripture that kind of supports it. Or something different? What do you think? I think it's because they might. (laughs) I'm going to go with option number three. Okay, perfect. Perfect. (laughs) My option number three is that they think because it's in the Old Testament that it doesn't apply. Ah, that's a very good option. Okay. It's they're ignorant on what the scripture actually says, right? Yeah. Okay. So I want to look into this. And I wanted to give you the objective that I'm shooting for because today and the closing session are all moving toward this. And I want to now kind of tee everything up and and play my card, so to speak, so you know where this is going. I want to bring about repentance in people's lives. Repentance is when you cause them to rethink what they used to believe is true. And now that they see the truth, they change the action in their lives. And that change in their lives 
is to bring them more in alignment and conformity with God's will for them. That's what repentance is. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So in very clear terms, not honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy is sin. Mm. That's what we've seen in the last two sessions, and we're going to see it really, really clearly in this session. Mm -hmm. And this is an important topic, and I'm going to make a lot of people uncomfortable who are listening (laughs) because I'm going to be talking about their sacred cows that they hold very dear because it's what they want. Oh, goodness. Okay. (laughs) So uh, let me just kind of uh, say right up front, if you don't want to be uncomfortable and you are not really honoring the Sabbath like you, uh, like maybe God would have told you in the Old Testament you need to do, okay, mm-hmm. and you think it's irrelevant today, if you don't want to be uncomfortable, just go and skip the session because God, I think, is going to convict your heart through Scripture, all right? Okay. I want to come back to a little bit from our topic last last session on the Ten Commandments. If I were to ask you, Penny, how would you define the Ten Commandments? What would you tell me? Mm. Ten Commandments. Um, a list of rules, regulations, um, things that the Lord wants us to maintain in order to have blessing in our lives. Okay. Rules and regulations. So we talked last session, real interesting, about the difference between a covenant and a law. And we came to the conclusion that a covenant was a commitment between two people that they entered voluntarily and they committed to each other. And a law is a set of rules that one person writes and dictates to many people and they have to follow it or their repercussions. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. If you were to describe the 10 commandments in the term of covenant or a law, what would be the better term? The 10 commandments. Um, Hmm. Good question. It's kind of hard because technically it's both. Okay. Yes. Yes. But it's called in the Old Testament a covenant. And even in the New Testament, it's called a covenant. The old covenant is passing away. The new covenant has come. So even though it's a law, it's a law because it defines what sin is. This is where we have Paul in Romans 7 says, I would not have known that coveting was sin except for the law that said, thou shalt not covet. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. Okay, so the old covenant defines what sin is, and it's that law of sin that we've been under. This is where we're no longer under law, but under grace. But does that mean that we're no longer to try to be to live without sin, or does that mean that we're no longer have to be perfect in order to have salvation. Hmm. We no longer have to be perfect. Yeah. But God still calls us to be holy, right? Yes. And what is a simple definition of holiness? Um, set apart. Set apart. Okay. Um, Without sin? Yes. Okay. So holiness is really the opposite of sin. Yes. And we're called to be holy even today in the new covenant, which means we're still called to refrain from those things that are sinful. This is where Paul always talks about die to yourself and die to sin. You put, you know, put sin to death, right? Yes. Yeah. So why did God give the Ten Commandments, this covenant, to Israel? Any idea? To... um solidify that they are set apart and they're holy. They're his chosen people. Yeah. We're going to see that, uh, uh, that it's, a, it's actually a lot more significant than that. What was going on is that the 10 commandments were actually the wedding vow between God and Israel, not simply to show them that they are set apart, but to show them how, They are to be holy. 
because he is a holy God. Okay. So let me start to show this to you. Can I do that? Absolutely. All right. First off, if I were to say that God married Israel, that Israel was God's bride, Mm -hmm. would you agree with that or would that surprise you? No, I would agree with that. Okay. So let's look in scripture where it actually says that. I want to kind of take you on this journey now. So let's go to Jeremiah 31, verse 32. Uh, We'll do these in the ESV. And uh, as you get there, this is God speaking about Israel. Okay. Okay. Jeremiah 31, verse 32. Mm -hmm. And that reads, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Ah, So here we have God very clearly declaring that he was the husband of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Did God ever divorce Israel? No. Okay, let's look at uh, what number. Let me ask you, would it sound strange if God did divorce Israel? Yes. All right. So let's look at something very strange. Let's go to Jeremiah three, verse eight, and we're only going to read the first half of it. Okay, Jeremiah three, verse eight. And that reads, she saw that for all the adulteries of the faithless one, Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Ooh, a decree of marriage. Is that what he said? No, he said divorce. Divorce. You mean God actually divorced Israel? That's what it appears to say. Does that strike you as... Um, unnerving or surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So why did God divorce Israel? She was being disobedient. Yeah. She was being unfaithful. So here's the here. So now we start to see that there's something going on here. And the question is what, and I want to try to bring some, uh, some balance and some perspective to this. Because this covenant that we have, the old covenant that is now the new covenant, you'll, we'll see that in just a moment, is not irrelevant today. It is very relevant today. And so when one person marries another person, the definition of being unfaithful is that they break the vow that they committed to their spouse. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Okay. Okay. If you were to be with another man, you would break the vow to Brian, and therefore you would be declared unfaithful to your marriage with Brian. But if you simply smoked in the house, that wouldn't be considered unfaithful unless if you put in your vow, your marriage vow, that I will never smoke in the house. Mm -hmm. Now, if you smoke, it would be considered unfaithful. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? It does, yeah. Okay. So unfaithfulness is based on the standard that you agree to, the standard for Israel was a standard of holiness. I'm going to show this to you, but I want to give you the concept behind the standard. Um, I want to talk about being equally yoked in marriage because Mm -hmm. what happens is God uses our relationship with each other to describe our relationship with him. Okay, so watch this. Turn real quickly to 2 Corinthians 6.14. This is talking about marriage. Let's okay. let's read what Paul says there. Second Corinthians 6 verse 14 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has right, righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? All right. So let's read this in God's perspective. I want to reread this with God talking about Israel. I cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership can i in righteousness have with you in lawlessness or what fellowship can i in light have with you in darkness okay we can Mm -hmm. kind of trans transpose what god is saying from a spiritual standpoint that he cannot be unequally yoked Mm -hmm. is this making sense it is yeah okay we're not to be unequally yoked because we are representation marriage is a representation between our relationship and him. 
So if God commands us not to be unequally yoked, we see that this is a pattern. Do you think he probably had that same command with Israel? Yes. That if I'm going to marry you, you need to be holy. Yes. Okay. Let's look at that. So we find this in Leviticus 11.45. Okay. All right. Uh, Leviticus 11 verse 45 reads, For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Ah, so now we see that God is saying, you be holy, so because I'm holy, we're going to be equally yoked. I'm not going to marry someone that is unequally yoked with me. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. And so if he says, you shall be holy because I am holy, then what is the standard of holiness? Mm. What, any idea of what the Bible says? This is the standard of holiness. God's, God's holiness. Yeah, God's yeah. holiness. And how do we... What would be the, where would he articulate what his holiness is? I'm not sure. All right. So it's the wedding vow. Because the holiness is the standard to which Israel was measured against. And it was the standard against which she became unfaithful and he Mm -hmm. divorced her. Mm -hmm. That wedding vow is the Ten Commandments. Now, let me see if I can prove this to you in just a moment, okay? Okay. Okay. So let's go back to what Paul says in Romans 7. I would not have known that coveting was sin, except that the law said you shall not covet. So if sin is the opposite of holiness, and holiness is a decent definition of how to be holy is to be without sin. Then can you start to see how the Ten Commandments, which he's calling the law here, Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, Do you see how the Ten Commandments is a definition of what sin is or in the opposite, a definition of what holiness is? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. What I want to do is I want to do a quick survey of the Ten Commandments. Okay. And show you how each one is focused on an attribute of God. And each attribute represents a component of God's holiness and how in each attribute he's requiring as his marriage covenant with Israel, he's requiring Israel to be holy and match the holiness that he has. So they can be equally yoked. So uh, you can turn to with these uh, with me. I'm going to read them, but you can follow along. So the 10 commandments are in Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Exodus 20, verse three is commandment number one. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. And what this means in terms of God's attribute, it means that God is the only God. There are no other gods. And because he is the only God, he is the only God to be worshiped. That's Mm -hmm. an attribute of God. Mm -hmm. Let's look at command number four. This is in verses eight and 10. And this is about the Sabbath. Okay, so he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Mm. So this represents that the actions that God did in creation, which is work six days and rest on the seventh, represents a holiness of God. It's a pattern of holiness because he did that pattern. That pattern is now declared holy. And it's what he did. And now we're to do what he does because we're to conform to how he is. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we look at the fifth commandment. This is verse 12. It says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land and that the Lord your God is uh, in the land that the Lord your God has given you. So what this is doing is this is a representation. So many, many of the things that we're commanded to do is the covenant that defines what holiness is represents the holiness that either is in God himself or in the relationship between God and man. 
And this is kind of that shadow. It's kind of a transition between those two because God is the creator. That's an attribute of him. He created all. He created us. And we're to honor him and we're to honor his shadow of creator on earth, which is our mother and father. Mm -hmm. They are our natural creators representing our heavenly creator. And we're to honor our mother and father as a way of honoring our creator in heaven. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Then we go down to uh, command number seven, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. And so the reason adultery is so bad, it's because one spouse is unfaithful to the other. The reason that's bad is because God marries us. We're the bride of Christ and we're to be faithful and not unfaithful. And so marriage in the natural represents our marriage relationship with Christ in the spiritual. Another Mm -hmm. attribute of God. And the final one we'll look at is number 10. This is verse 17. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servants, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. In other words, the reason this is a matter of holiness is because God is not only our creator, but he is our provider. He provides all things for us. And he provides us all that we need and all that he chooses for us to have. And if we are to covet what he's given someone else, We're judging him and saying that he's not good enough for us yeah. because he hasn't given us enough. Does that make sense? It does, yes. So each of these represents an attribute of God's holiness, and that's why these define what sin is, and conversely, they define what holiness is. And Mm -hmm. you have um, uh, Israel was commanded to be holy as God is holy, and so the standard that they're going to be measured against is the wedding vow. Are they going to be faithful or not? And this is why, where we saw back in Jeremiah, God divorced Israel because she was unfaithful. Unfaithful to what? Unfaithful to her wedding vow. That's the only way you can divorce someone is if they are unfaithful to their wedding vow. Hmm. Is this kind of making some sense? Bringing yeah. some clarity? Okay. It is, yeah. So that's why the old covenant is so holy. It represents God's holiness. And it's also called God's testimony. This is where we get the Ark of the Testimony. It's the same thing as the Ark of the Covenant. These are God's testimonies of holiness. And um, so now that we looked at that, that's the old covenant. I want to now talk about this new covenant that we have. Okay. Okay. So Israel was the bride of God, the father, and we are the bride of Christ. Is that right? Yes. And Christ and the father are one, correct? Correct. So would it make sense that if they are one, then the same standard of holiness that the father held Israel to, and that became the wedding vow, the covenant, Would it make sense that would be the same standard of holiness that we would be held to with Christ? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I I want to be sensitive. I'm not saying that we have to perform for salvation. That was the law. The law was you have to perform for salvation. We're now under grace because Christ performed it for us. But the standard of holiness is the same. The command to be holy is the same. It's just that the repercussion of not being holy in the old covenant is you don't hit salvation, okay, if you take Christ out. Um, And the repercussion today is not that we lose our salvation. The repercussion is when we live in habitual sin, God is not pleased, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, let me ask another question. If Christ, if if God had a covenant with Israel for their marriage, do we have a covenant with Christ for our marriage with him? I would think so, yeah. Yeah. What would that covenant be called? 
Um, I'm not sure what you're asking for there. So okay. So uh, how about new covenant? If the covenant with Israel was the old covenant, how about the covenant with Christ is the new covenant? Does that okay. make sense? Yes. I thought okay. you were looking okay. for something a little more specific. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, right. Right. Well, it's just uh, that. That's what the New Testament calls it. So let's just call it that. Right. Yeah. Uh, but we don't we don't really think of us having a covenant with Christ. This is the issue. And we don't think about what that covenant is. But if we have a covenant with Christ, which is the new covenant, what would be the vows of that new covenant? The vows would be us expressing that we're basically the sinner's prayer. I, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm in need of a savior and accepting Christ into our heart. Okay. And how do we know that we're a sinner? Because the Bible tells us. <laughs> okay. But what's the standard that we've sinned against? I mean, if I, if I go out and I, um, uh, if I smoke a cigarette, does the Bible call that sin? No. Okay. So what in our lives is sin? Anything that keeps us from being holy. Okay. And if we were to kind of reference some part of the Bible that tells us what to be, how to be holy, what would that be? I mean, I guess you could use the Ten Commandments. Ah, any okay. Other thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could. Because that's the standard that God said for Israel to be holy. That's the standard that defines what holiness is. Mm -hmm. So would it make sense that maybe our new covenant vows with Christ are the same vows that the old covenant vows God had with Israel? Mm -hmm. And here's, here's why I say this, okay? Uh, the old covenant was called the testimony of God. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. Okay. Does God's testimony ever change? No. Does it ever become obsolete? No. Is Can it ever be improved on? No. Okay. It's pretty perfect the way it it's, is. <laughs> it's pretty perfect. So would it make sense that the testimony of God in the Old Testament with Israel, God's bride, would be the same testimony of God in the New Testament with us, God's bride. Mm -hmm. It never changes. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We, we think it's because it's old covenant or like what you said, because it's old Testament, it's irrelevant today. Mm -hmm. But it's not irrelevant because God's not irrelevant. His word never changes. His testimonies never change. And I want to show you something that's really cool. Okay. But okay. we, do, we do have a problem with this. We came up on this in our first session, and we're going to have a little bit of problem with it today if we're not careful. Turn real quickly to Hebrews 8.13. So we're talking about the old covenant versus the new covenant. And we're saying that God's word does not become obsolete. His testimonies never change. And yet we come up with God's word that tells us something that puts a little bit of conundrum on it. Let's read this. Hebrews okay. 8, 13. Hebrews 8, 13. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Ah, so if the old covenant is called the testimony of God. How can that become obsolete if his testimonies can't become obsolete? Hmm. I mean, the only thing I can think of is because this is probably referring to Christ coming and fulfilling the law and okay. becoming the new covenant. So, uh, so let me ask a few other questions because this is where the conundrum gets to, and this is what we're about to clear up. Was the old covenant holy? Yes. Are God's words and testimony holy? Yes. Do they ever cease to be holy? No. How can something holy become obsolete then? That's a big conundrum, isn't it? Hmm. It's, a, it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. So 
I want to show you how scripture reconciles this and show you that what we think of as being obsolete is wrong. How we've been interpreting this, a lot of us anyway. And and here's probably where I really want to say a lot of us, we understand that there's some truth here, but we can't quite reconcile what scripture is saying because it, it, we, there's not a grid for it yet. And so I want to put this grid down on the, on the table and show you what Scripture is actually talking about here. So the new covenant was actually foretold in the Old Testament. It's in Jeremiah. We're going to read this. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. And I want to take it verse by verse. So read, if you would, Jeremiah 31, verse 31. 3131. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. That says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay. So he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. What is the new covenant God's speaking about? Christ. Yeah. That's our covenant with Christ. Is this a covenant that Christ fulfilled? I mean, a a prophecy Christ fulfilled? Yes. Yeah. So this is when Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. The law, meaning the Jewish law, those things that pointed towards him. Not so much he fulfilled the covenant law, but when he says, I fulfilled the law and the prophets, he's not saying, I fulfilled the covenant vows. Okay. Mm -hmm. I maintained them. He was perfectly sinless. But the law he's talking about is something a little bit different. And then look at the next verse. This is now Jeremiah 31, 32a, just the first half. And let's read that one. So this is the first verse says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And now we're going to pick up here. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Okay. So, so he says, this is the new covenant is not going to be like the covenant that i made with the their fathers okay so Mm -hmm. this is talking about the old covenant that we've been talking about that we call the ten commandments so jesus god is saying i'm gonna make a new covenant but it's not going to be like the old covenant in what way is this new covenant not going to be like the old covenant any idea well because jesus wasn't in the old covenant (laughs) i mean he wasn't physically there (laughs) Well, now it does say that the rock followed Israel throughout the wilderness and the rock That's was Christ. True. Okay? That's true. So, um, so <laughs> let's, let's look at the next verse. We're now going to go to verse 33. And this is now going to answer the question, how can the old new covenant be different than the old covenant if the testimony of God is always the same? That's the, that's the conundrum we're up against. The conundrum that says, the, the Ten Commandments is irrelevant today because it's Old Testament. So mm-hmm. now let's look at it. This is going to open some eyes. Okay, verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I ah. will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay. So what does this say about the new covenant? It's going to be put in our hearts. Ah, how is that different from the old covenant? The old covenant was written on stone tablets. Ah. So this is going to be in every single person. Okay, so here's what is happening, okay? And this now starts to make a lot of sense with these passages that seem to be conflicting with each other. All right, here's what's going on. The new covenant is the same as the old covenant, except it's now relocated from tablets of stone to hearts of flesh. Mm -hmm. I want to underscore a couple of things about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Throughout all of scripture, does God ever write anything? You know, all the scriptures have been written by men, but does, is there any place where he says that he actually writes his word with his finger. Uh, yes. Where? I don't remember where, but I do remember him saying he writes it 
All right. On so, the tablets of our heart, if I recall. Yeah. So we just read one part. I'm mm-hmm. going to write it on the tablets of their heart. And if we go back to the Old Testament, he wrote it on tablets of stone. Those are the only two places where God himself actually writes his word. Everywhere else, man is writing it on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Do you think if God were to write on tablets of stone, even though they're stone, do you think that writing would be extremely holy since it came directly from his finger? Of course. Yeah. When he writes it on our tablets, on on our hearts, do you think that too would be extremely holy since he writes it with his finger? Of course. So we're going to see this um, next session. Okay. And we're going to see this thing of God's holiness. But what I want to pull out here is why is this a new covenant if it's the same words? Mm. If it's the same testimony? And here's what I like to suggest. The old covenant with Israel was written on tablets of stone because it represented their hard, stony hearts that would never conform to his image. Mm. Do you you recall? I mean, throughout Israel's history, they were always in rebellion. And he consistently uses the word, you're a harlot, you're a prostitute, you're an adulterer. You remember mm. all those words about the whole Testament talking about Israel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he destroyed Israel and threw him into exile for that reason. But then look at this. Now he says, I'm going to write my testimonies, the new covenant, on hearts of flesh. Mm. So now they are within us. And the question then is, uh, first off, are we still obligated to that covenant vow? even though now it's written on our hearts. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're still obligated to do our best to be holy, okay? Yes. But how does this mean that it's obsolete? If you were to say, so, so you know, go mean, going back to Hebrews, it says the old covenant is being made obsolete because of the new covenant. Here in Jeremiah, God is saying, I'm going to make a new covenant, not like the old covenant, because this new covenant, I'm going to write it on their hearts. I'm going to be their God, and they're going to be my people. So how does that make the old covenant obsolete if it's the same testimony? Hmm. Good question. All right. So let me give you an idea. Uh, okay. Are you familiar with the old, the older computers? I, I say it's old for, uh, for some of our listeners, it's probably ancient. But in our days, you had this great big metal box, and it either sit on the floor or you stick it on the desktop. You remember yes. that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's the old days of computers. But let me describe what the old days of computers, how they were built. They had a power supply, a microprocessor. They had memory. They would process code and analyze it, and then they would display that code on on a monitor, and then we would have a keyboard and a mouse, and everything was connected by cords, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you were to carry your computer and monitor somewhere, you probably got 20 or 30 pounds of stuff that you're lugging around. Mm -hmm. Or more. (laughs) Or more, right? So what type of computer do you have? What what does it look like? Uh, It's it's um very small it's a laptop okay. it's very yeah. lightweight <laughs> all right it hardly ever needs a cord or a that's mouse. right <laughs> yeah exactly so let me ask you but let's see if the components are the same do you have a power supply i do does it have a microprocessor it does does it have memory it does does it process software code it does and it displays it on a monitor it does and you have a key and a keyboard and a mouse i or do mouse pad okay yeah so here's the thing. It's the same thing. It's just better. Yes. It makes the old one obsolete because the new one is much better, but all of the insides, it's the identical process. Do you see it? Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So our new covenant is the same thing. It's simply the old covenant relocated. That's all the new covenant is, but it's the same process of holiness. It's the same standard of holiness. It's the same obligation of holiness. It's just now it's written on our hearts. And now that it's written on our hearts, because Christ is in our hearts, we can now actually fulfill holiness because Christ has fulfilled it for us. 
Mm. We now have a greater ability to refrain from sin because we have Christ and the Holy Spirit in us that helps us refrain from sin. But it's the same covenant. Is that making sense? It does. Yeah. The, the same vows. So as we start to wrap up, what does it mean to have the covenant repositioned in our hearts? I want to look at this real quickly. So okay. go to Psalm 40, verse 8. Okay, let's see. Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Okay. So that's the law, the covenant. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Your will is the law, and that law is this law of holiness. It's not the rules and regulations of the Jewish society. It's God's standard of holiness. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And now he says, your law is within my heart. So this is a prophecy of the new covenant. Because we saw in Jeremiah that the new covenant was the law is written in our heart. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Okay. So what this is what this means to us is now that the covenant is in our heart, we desire to do his will. Israel did not desire to do his will, but we as the bride of Christ do, because the law is written in our heart. This is why we Anyone listening to this episode is saying, I want to do God's will. That's why you're listening to it, okay? Mm -hmm. It holds an interest because of the law being written in our heart. That's the, that's the whole, only difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's the location of where it is. And then we find, and this is real interesting, turn to Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. I want to connect these dots to for you, and this maybe will start to make sense. What we find is that Christ fulfills that law in us. It's not that Christ fulfilled the law outside of us, and now we just kind of participate. Look at what the Lord tells us through Paul in Romans, Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. Okay. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Pause for a moment. Let me des describe it. So the law, the commandments. This is so just before here, we have Romans 7. Paul says, if it were not for the law, I would not have known what sin is. OK, mm -hmm. but the whole the whole book of Romans is saying you cannot reach salvation simply by doing the law because there's no way to to do it. And that's what this is saying. He says, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do when it's written on tablets of stone. We could not do it. So now continue. Okay. Um, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled within us. Okay, stop. So the righteous requirement of the law, that's holiness, right? That's what righteousness is, is being holy. Mm -hmm. The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled outside of us or in us? In us. In us. Does that kind of tie back to that the law is written on our heart and in, in us? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is the, the new covenant is that now the law is in us and all the requirement has been fulfilled in us. So since it's already in us and it's been fulfilled by grace, then we can go out and have a heyday and just sin all we want and there's no consequence, right? Incorrect. <laughs> okay, you're right. incorrect. We're no longer under law but under grace, but we're still under obligation to pursue holiness. Correct. Okay. So as we wrap up, what are some big takeaways that you think might be the big takeaways for our people out there? What are the key points? Um, I think the key points are remembering that we that the Lord does want to bless us, but in order for us to be blessed in all these different areas of our life, we have to choose to remain holy. And in order to do that, we have to follow his rules and his regulations and obey them. 
Yeah, uh, let me rephrase that because following his rules and regulations seems onerous. Man, this person makes these rules and I've got to follow them. True, yeah, true. And, and I want to rephrase it to what it technically is. We are obligated to follow our covenant with Christ. It's a loving covenant, just like your covenant with Brian is a loving covenant. You voluntarily entered into it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a rule or regulation that Brian demands of you. It's a covenant that you committed to Brian. Correct. Yes. And so we follow the covenant obligations that the Lord in his loving kindness has made with us that we might be holy because he is holy and he is now helped us define what that holiness looks like in our life. Mm -hmm. And this is why Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've actually committed adultery with her because mm -hmm. sin is of the heart. It's not of the actions. We're going to see this in the next section, uh, next episode on, on this radical faith that uh, uh, when Jesus, when God, divorced Israel, it wasn't because of her actions. It was because of her heart. You're unfaithful in your heart. The actions are only symptomatic of what's in your heart. Mm, yeah, that's good. So what questions might you think some of our listeners might be having on this topic right now? Anything? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some people out there that still feel like well, what's the point? Why do I need to observe a Sabbath? I mean, that's pointless. It's that was that was a long time ago. Like that's not relevant for today. People's lives are so busy. You know, we have ABC XYZ, and we have to do it. And we have to fit it in, and those kinds of things. That's a great thing. You know, why do we have to remain pure and not commit adultery? I mean, there's so many gorgeous women out there. Why do I have to stay pure to my wife? Mm. Mm-hmm. Why do I have to stay pure? Because you are in covenant with your wife. Ah, and in covenant with my wife. And I'm also in covenant with my Lord. And my Lord said, don't commit adultery. Mm -hmm. You remember with your children, mom, why do I have to do that? What would be your response? Uh -huh. Because I said so. <laughs> ah, isn't that, a, isn't that a good answer here? Why do I have to keep the Sabbath holy? Because God said so. Because God said so. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> is there any better reason? <laughs> no. And, you know, that's funny that you say that, Beatty, because Jesus says, unless you come to me like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So truly, as we get older, we should be getting more like children. <laughs> we very much should be. And on our next and final episode, a lot more of this is going to come to clarity. But let me leave our listeners with a challenge. Just a simple challenge. The evidence is unmistakable that the Sabbath is part of God's plan for holiness. It's obligated to us today with our covenant with Christ. It's part of the Ten Commandments. That's to we're to follow forever. Mm -hmm. The pattern of working six days and resting on the seventh is a pattern of extreme holiness. We're going to see this next time, but it's extreme holiness. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, the Lord placed them in a certain sequence for a reason. The most important thing is number one. I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. I would think that the least important, even though they're all important, if we, you know, there are measures of sin. And the least important out of those is not to covet. But why would you, why do you think that commandment number four is to keep his Sabbath day holy? Why does that come ahead of not committing adultery and not committing murder? Think mm -hmm. about that for a moment. We may not have all the answers, but what we do have is the observation that there is a sequence that God reveals these in, that God writes them in, and mm -hmm. he did place the Sabbath above these other things that we know are atrocities. Mm -hmm. 
Could that indicate to some degree what the Lord considers violating the holiness of the Sabbath to be in our lives? And so until next session, I'd like to leave you with this challenge. Think through your life. And most of us, we use Sunday as the Sabbath. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, So how do you treat Sunday as holy? And do you truly set it aside as a holy day? Or do you treat it as a common day where you do a little bit of holy stuff? You go to church and then the rest of the day, you go play sports, you go to practice, you uh, go to children's football games or baseball games, or you, um, uh, you do work, you go catch up, you start to, you know, go to grocery shopping because that's the only day you got to do it. Do you treat it as holy or do you treat it as common? And do you think the way that you treat your Sabbath day honors the Lord and causes him to jump up and down with joy and say, look at my faithful servant. Look how that person is honoring that day that I call most holy. Mm. That's where we need to be. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thing to ponder. So, um, yeah. So listeners, that's your challenge. (laughs) <laughs> for the for the time remaining between this one and, and our next session, really ponder that, really think about it, pray about it, talk to the Lord about it, be honest with him. Um, he's a big, he's a big boy. He can handle our, um, all of our shortcomings and all the places where we feel like we failed. He can handle it. Yes. So good. Um- Well, Beatty, thank you so very much um, again for such a great session. This was super insightful, and I know that um, our listeners will benefit from this as well. Um, For those of you who have not done so, please subscribe um, and please share this with your friend. If you have a friend or a coworker or family member that you feel like could benefit from this teaching, we would love for you to share this with them as well. And uh, we look forward to um, being with you again very soon. And you guys have a very blessed day. And one final word of encouragement. Listen to these a second time. Mm -hmm. You will get so much out of it because you're usually listening to it in an environment where you're occupied doing other things and you miss. Go back through a second time. You're going to pick up so much more. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. And you guys have a very blessed day. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it so you never miss another episode. Also, if you want an easy way to grow your business, check out Agent Dominator. We guarantee listings and sales from past clients in sphere of influence, geographic farming, and commercial investment properties. If you don't get the sales, we promise we'll give your money back. Learn more on our website at GetSellersCallingYou.com and select Agent Dominator from the menu. Thanks for listening to the Get Sellers Calling You podcast and have a great day.